soon as you mention one of the other bad things that philosophers did, I'd love if you go back to that slide. <laughs> I have 207 slides, by the way. I learned this from a guy named Larry Lessig, who did a lot of open source law stuff. And he would do this. Now, this was slow for me. I've been, I've been able to do 200 slides in maybe five minutes. Boom, 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 boom. It keeps me occupied. I don't know if the rest of the people find it entertaining, but it keeps me uh, energized. What's, what's this, Andrew? It's showing, it's towards the end. What was the quantum again? See, I have so many slides. Uh, it's, it's the end. Yeah, I think it's like one of the very last. Oh, one of the very last ones. OK, yeah. I didn't number them. That's my problem. You're fine. You're fine. Um, it's just uh, you said that. Not all oh yeah. People, right. Oh yeah. This is the dirty Sorry, stuff this here. I've even got Searle on here, which is kind of controversial because he's still a living guy. The rest of these I can beat up on. So Rousseau had five kids, all of whom he dropped off at the Paris Foundling Hospital, which at that time was a sentence of death. I don't think that's too good as a philosopher to just drop your kids off and at the found, Foundling Hospital. So I found that unethical. I got a problem with that. Wittgenstein, this is a little known fact. So Wittgenstein in the 20s, um, early 20s, so Wittgenstein was from a very, very wealthy family in Austria, um, like the Rockefellers or something like that in the US. And, um, kind of wanted to escape that destiny of, that he had from being one of the Wittgensteins. So he, he would incognito went to teach elementary school in these rural areas in Austria. And um, he beat the students. And there was a student of his named uh, Josef Heidbauer, who was 11 years old at the time, who Wittgenstein hit and the kid died. I got a problem with killing people. You know, nonviolence to me is kind of an important value. So I, I'm not really a big, huge Wittgenstein fan for that reason. Heidegger, I don't know if you know much about Heidegger, but he was an unrepentant Nazi. He was a very strong Nazi collaborator as a rector in the University of Freiburg, I believe it was. Um, he thought all this was a great revolution. And he never really, kind of came out and said, yeah, that was a really bad idea. So I got a problem with that. Um, Sartre, well, Sartre and de Beauvoir, uh, basically, Simone de Beauvoir, they had an open marriage, basically, or a long-term relationship. She would s kind of feed young women to Sartre, so sort of seduce them, and then hand them off to Sartre. I kind of got a problem with that. I'm a feminist, you know, I'm a female chauvinist. I don't know if I'm a feminist, but I'm a female chauvinist. I got three sisters, and I don't really like that. Now, I was a big Ayn Rand fan, but, you know, she had her problems. You, you should, you gotta, everyone's got to get started somewhere, so don't hold it against me. Um, it, you know, so I, she was cheating on her husband for years and would say, oh, well, my husband is, you know, the most important thing in my life. Why are you cheating on him? That's, that's kind of stupid. Foucault. Um, he was basically a devoted disciple of the Marquis de Sade. Um, so he, was, he was into S&M, basically. And, yeah, you know, views can be differ, differ on that, but he kind of did this in a way that was, I think, kind of exploitative, shall we say, of other people, which to me is not respecting others. Searle, this is a sort of an open controversy about John Searle, but, and actually Thomas Polga, who, was the teacher at Columbia has, I almost added him, but I ran out of room. Um, <laughs> so many unethical philosophers. Searle basically, you know, is kind of tit for tat, um, you know, sexual harassment um, at Berkeley. Um, so this is not an, ex an exhaustive list. There isn't et cetera over here. So it's probably more that I just haven't studied. But to me, that's, you know, kind of problematic. Uh, and I am of the philosophy that you have to live your ideas and you have to treat people well. And if you're not living your philosophy, then you're a hypocrite. Now, there's no monopoly on hypocrisy, but that doesn't mean we need to be hypocrites. And these are from all sorts of different schools of philosophy, right? But you can be a bad person and still, you can even teach all this good stuff and still be a bad person. It's kind of crazy, but that's how humans are.
So thank you for the question, Andrew. Thanks for indulging my uh, <laughs> talking about, you know. That's the bad stuff. We don't like to talk about them. Uh, but you know, yes, anyway, yes? When, what was your name? Uh, sorry, my name is Sage. Sage, nice uh, to meet you. By the way, Sage is a great name for someone interested in philosophy. So I mean, cool. it doesn't get better than that. Maybe Sophia is a good one, too. Yeah. Um, uh, well, it's interesting. I like ancient philosophy. So I, I did philosophy in classics, right? Um, so that's what I know the most about. Um, so, so, for instance, Epicurus. Even people who didn't like Epicurus's views recognized that he was an exemplary person. He treated everyone with respect. Supposedly he had thousands of friends. This was before Facebook. I don't know what he would do now. But he had thousands because he was very good to people. Uh, so I like Epicurus, even though I don't, you know, I don't fully agree with anything. I don't even fully agree with myself half the time. So uh, it makes it difficult to say I disagree with any existing, you know, any of the older philosophers. I like, I like Aristotle. I'm a big Aristotle fan. One of the things I like about Aristotle is that he wrote on so many things. This year I've reread all the complete works of Aristotle. I'm, now I'm reading the capstone to this whole project is reading, rereading the Nicomachean Ethics. And he wrote about poetry. He wrote about uh, biology. He wrote about logic. He wrote about so many different things that are really fascinating to read and kind of get into that whole worldview. And I like Greek. Greek is just a cool language, right? It's got all these, the characters are different, stuff like that. And so I like to read the Greek. I don't just read the Greek. I read the English, and then I go back and look at the Greek. So Aristotle, I like Thoreau a lot. Uh, he's an American philosopher from only, you know, he actually last year was the bicentenary of Thoreau's birth, which is why I wrote the little book in time for his 200th birthday. He didn't really appreciate it, but um, he's kind of cool. I mean, he, he, um, he was influenced a lot by the Stoics. He was interested in, influenced by Hinduism. He was, a, and Eastern philosophy. Um, as over time, I wish I knew Chinese and Japanese and stuff like that. I like a lot, I like Taoism a lot. Um, I find that very interesting. I wish I could, I don't have the time because I don't even have the time for the things I do, but I wish I you know, could learn classical Chinese or something like that and really understand those um, Taoist philosophers and Confucianism and stuff like that. Um, if I had more time, I'd read up on Buddhism and learn about that. There's just there's not enough time in the world. But so those, those are some those are some of the people I like. All very humanistic. Right. You know that's sort of my my thing. So thank you, Sage. It was nice to talk about. <laughs> yes, next to Sage, what was your name? I'm Oliver. Oliver, nice to meet you, Oliver. Um, gosh, I don't know that I should say this in, in a, the halls of learning, but, you know, I, I, I decided not to go on with more schooling, um, uh, in part because I kind of burned myself out, and in part because I sort of wanted to get on with life. Um, so what I did was try to learn on the side. So I started learning programming and stuff like that. It's actually much easier than it used to be. There's also, there are a lot of other options, things like the, these boot camps that exist nowadays. So there's data science boot camps, Galvanize, and all these companies run these boot camps. Uh, I know several people who've gone through those. Uh, that's a good way to sort of get started, get your foot in the door, uh, because it, it kind of, it's, it's a boot camp, right? They're forcing you to do stuff, right? And they, you gotta do all these exercises and work really hard. Uh, so I think something like that depends on what you wanna do. Now, the, I'm talking tech. Right, so in the technology industry, there's things like boot camps. Let's say you wanted to um, get into finance or something like that. Well, you might want to learn statistics or you might want to learn, you know, read up on econ and stuff like that. You can, there's a lot that, I mean, there's so much now that is available that wasn't available when I was a kid, when I walked, you know, 10, ten miles to school in the snow each way and all that kind of stuff, uphill. Um, I'm starting to sound like an old fart, I guess, but, um, 
you know, so there's YouTube videos. There's so much that's out there that you can learn about physics or learn about statistics and stuff like that. Um, there's all these open source packages for there's things like R for stats and stuff like that. There's a lot of ways to if you apply yourself to learn learn you know, on the side, and that's a lot of what I did. So you don't I don't think you really need to double major or you know major and minor and stuff like that. Um, I wish so in high school even I took programming languages, statistics, and stuff like that, and I sort of let that lapse when I was in college. Uh, I would have gotten a faster start in life if I had done some of that on the side. Yes? What, what's your name? Uh, Justine. Justine, nice to meet you, Justine. Nice to meet you. Um, you talked a lot about how studying philosophy and being a philosophy major uh, would help in having a successful life. Um, so, what advice would you give to a My philosophy is that the degree doesn't really matter. I think it matters who you are and to demonstrate the things that you can do. Um, I don't know that people really pay attention to degrees, at least in my field, because I have, there's so many people in technology who are just self-trained. Um, yeah, maybe, you know, were you a comp sci major and you know about compilers and, you know, things like that. Yeah, sometimes that helps. Uh, but a lot of that you can learn on your own. Now that, so the technology field is good in that way. Um, you know, there probably are fields where they want to see you have the degree. Like let's say you wanted to go work on Wall Street. Well, they're going to want you to have an econ degree or something like that, right? So it's harder in those fields, I think, to sort of you know, pretend or wing it or learn your way along. Uh, so there are, obviously you can't become a doctor or a psychologist or something like that without a degree. So to, in contrast to what Oliver's saying, like let's say I wanted to become a counselor. Um, well, you have to be licensed. You got to get, you have to go to a program. You can't just call, you hang up your shingle and say I'm a psychologist. Uh, so it depends, I think a lot depends on what you're interested in. And by the way, in terms of interests, um, one thing that I wish I had done and investigated more when I was an undergrad was um, something like the, I wish I had gone to the Career Center, right? And because they've got lots of tools. There's this thing called, my wife has a PhD in industrial organizational psychology. She went back to, and went to CSU and got a, by the way, industrial organizational psychology has the same number of syllables as supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Trivia question of the day. Um, <laughs> but there's things like the strong interest inventory. So there's, it's basically figures out what are you really interested in. Now you might reflect and think about what you're interested in, and maybe you think what you know what you're interested in. But the strong interest inventory they actually ask you a bunch of questions, and that can help direct you. Like, oh, I never really thought that I would want to be a you know that would be interested in statistics or something like that. And so th there's a lot of tools out there that I'm sure the career de the career department here or whatever it is the, the career center can help with. And I, I kind of wish I had done that because I like technology. It's not the be all and end all for me, but I probably would have learned earlier on if I had done something like that and talked to people in the career center because I didn't talk to anyone when I was an undergraduate, um, not even Professor Lee, uh, who I went to school with, right? So, I mean, that kind of thing can help, I think, to really sort of use all the tools at your disposal to explore what things you might want to do because it, it can surprise you. And then, you, then you're into the practical syllogism part of figuring out, okay, well, I want to go into uh, you know, counseling, let's say. What do I need to do? Maybe I need to take some courses on the side. Maybe I do need to get a master's. It, a lot of it depends on where, where you want to go. But I think I do believe that your philosophy training is very useful in your career. Sure. Yes. Uh, what was your name? Don. Don, nice to meet you. Um, I, my question was about how did you, like you mentioned learning some of those practical skills or some of the things that might be less interesting. Yep. Or harder to learning how to be you have a finisher, you said. Yes. How did you motivate yourself to do that? Uh, well, unemployment is a pretty good motivator, I found in my experience. Um, you know, working in a dead-end job, getting fired was good. Uh, you know, that, that was a good motivator. Um, I found also that anything can, well not anything, but a lot of things can be interesting if you sort of 
approach them. A lot of how I've approached things is what can I learn? So even I might be, this might be a, a bad job. I might be working for a bad company. It might be bad people here. Maybe I'm about to get fired. Even that's a learning experience, right? So how can I view these things as learning experiences and really go into each job that I've had thinking, what do I want to learn here? Um, I found that has been very helpful. Um, and there might even be like, I told, I told you I know all about internationalization, which is how do you present text in different languages in computer systems. Intrinsically, it's kind of, it's a difficult topic. Um, but at one point, I was doing this industry standardization stuff, and I was on this board, basically. And I thought, well, what do I want to learn here? Well, I want everyone in the world to be able to use the internet, so maybe I'll use this as an opportunity to learn about internationalization. Unfortunately, it's a really hard problem. Um, but it was a fun, th you know, as I went into that role that I had in this industry group, I said, well, what are the two things I want to learn about? One was security, because information security is endless, and privacy and those things, um, and in internationalization. So I kind of approached it that way. Um, but even so things that don't seem interesting on the face of it can be interesting, like reading a balance sheet of a company, right? Profits and losses. Pfft, what do I care? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a philosophy guy. I, I don't care about money. I really don't. But um, learning, okay, there's a lot of information there in a balance sheet, and it tells you where they're investing, and it tells you what their expenses are and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of interesting to understand how a business functions or a nonprofit functions. Maybe they're wasting a bunch of money on marketing. A lot of nonprofits do, right? So you think, oh, I'm supporting this great cause. Psh, a lot of it money's going to admin salaries and more marketing to pull more money in. They're not really helping people. And you can look at a balance sheet and figure that out, right? So that's kind of how I've motivated myself, just to keep learning and keep interested in those things. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Yes, Sage. See, now I know Sage's name, and I can call her by name. Uh, well, I'd like to know if you could possibly answer what three of the most fundamental, fundamentally impactful works of philosophy have been to you, if you could think of any three. Wow. Uh, well, I'm a big Aristotle fan, so I got to make a plug for the Nick and McKean ethics. You know, I mean, the Nick and McKean ethics is is pretty awesome. Um, and it's, I've read it probably, I don't know, five, ten times? I don't know, probably at least half a dozen times. And I'm always learning new things from that. Um, even though I'm not really a, a fan of the Stoics at some level, I think Epictetus uh, is very interesting. He, ta he teaches you a lot about self-control, about your emotions. Um, Epicurus I like a lot, but it's very fragmentary. Uh, because only a certain little snippets of Epicurus have survived, so it's a little, that's why I'm translating them anew for, for all you wonderful folks, so that you'll have a better translation. Um, and I like um, Thoreau's Walden. Um, I'm a big Thoreau fan, even though you know, he's probably, I'm sure he doesn't get taught in the philosophy departments. He's, he's kind of a pop philosopher at some level. Uh, but he integrated um, a lot of the ancient traditions, both the Stoics and like say the Hindus and Taoism supposedly he was familiar with. It's hard to pick just three because I'm also a big fan of um, Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching. And I can just keep rereading that and, and trying to extrapolate what Lao Tzu was saying and then try to figure out what that means and try to apply that in my life. Uh, so I'm a big d d fan of Taoism too. Mm -hmm. uh, having those Eastern influences as well, the Stoics and all. Right. Yeah. They all, I mean, as I say, there's a lot of repeats, right. uh, you know, or, or um, what is this called? Uh, parallel invention. So people have in, found the same things over and over. I tend to be interested in that because maybe there's something more there than just one person saying it. It's the core of the human experience. Mm hmm. I, I like Nietzsche a lot too, but he, he's kind of difficult. He, he's a very slippery character. Um, like I like uh, Die Fröhliche Wissenschaft, uh, the gay science, or you know whatever, however it's translated. 
Um, that's kind of a cool work. I like that one a lot. Um, and, you know, but Nietzsche, he, he's he never really quite sure where you stand with Nietzsche, uh, which is part of the fun, don't get me wrong, but he's very easy to misinterpret, I think. No questions from this side over here. What's going on? It's all, it's all on this side. Okay, your name? Uh, Juan. Juan, nice to meet you. So, um, I'd like to uh, ask a question regarding your job. Okay. So, do you find yourself doing a lot more technical engineering stuff, or do you like to want to approach your job in a philosophical sense? So, like, you go in, you have the problem of internet naturalization, do you, do you do more engineering on it than you do philosophy? Um, yeah, there's more pizza. Don't feel afraid. It's getting cold here. Um, it's a little bit of both, probably. Um, I don't do as much programming as I used to uh, because I don't have time because I'm dealing with customers and stuff like that. So um, it's sort of more like applied philosophy almost, dealing with, you know, trying to communicate very well, try to communicate clearly, understand what their needs are. It's a lot of what I do. A lot of, even in, in, in elementary school, I was very good at those word problems in math, right? You had to, oh, they describe it in words and then you have to make it in the math. I've always been very good at translating between the technical side of things and the wordy side of things. Uh, so that's a lot of what I do in my job is translate between the technical stuff because I can talk to the engineers, but I can also talk to the customers or the partners or the people who are trying to design things. So that's a lot of what I do. Probably wrap up so yep. seven and while we can still give you a hand here. We yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll, like I said, I'll send the slides along and you know, if you folks want to send me an email, if you have follow some follow-up questions or something like that, happy to, uh, I'm always happy to help people. So uh, I'm very approachable that way. And if you want a, a free copy of one of my totally obscure books that no one reads, you know, feel free. If you're a big Epicurus fan, I, I got the goods for you. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for coming out.